Good morning. Good morning. This is Rest and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study, where we go through the Bible chapter by chapter and give you your whole Bible back. We are studying in First Chronicles today, First Chronicles chapter 12. And that's just very exciting to us. <laughs> we, We're moving right along, aren't we, we have, friends? We have relegated the puppies to their crates. We were letting them go outside and play that while we were working. having Bible study. But that doesn't quite work right now. They're in kind of a barky phase. <laughs> of course, you know, Deacon's two and yeah. Scarlet is, is one. Now. And so... I don't believe in the terrible twos. No, terrific twos is what I'm claiming. Yes, last <laughs> night uh, while Kitty was running some errands, between 5.30 and 6, we basically just had a bark fest here <laughs> for, a solid, for a solid hour. I left the sliding door open to the back patio, and they were running from the front door to the back door, back and forth, uh, along the fence in the backyard and just barking, barking, barking. <laughs> and uh, so they were very tired when they came in. No doubt. And they slept good. They yes. always sleep about almost 12 hours, those two dogs. So we're very thankful for that. Always reminds me of that verse of scripture. Uh, I am not a dumb dog that I cannot bark. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Talking about a good shepherd. Now, I want to... Uh, Back to the Bible. <laughs> You know how it is, folks, just keeping it real. Yeah. I want to paste a link, if it'll let me, into the chat box. For those of you that have not joined us on Periscope in the morning, in the morning, yes, there it is, in the morning before the daily Bible study, I broadcast on video the daily prophetic word from the night before. And so we're putting, hello, Jacqueline. Jacqueline signed up for Yay. the prophetic uh, mm -hmm. online prophetic activation course that starts October 21st. Glory. Welcome. If you have not taken the, the prophetic activation course, learning how to hear the voice of God in 12 weeks online, we're doing a discounted enrollment this time, and it starts October 21st. And if you will watch our website, go look at the emails that we send out, go to our Facebook, just look around. We're posting those links out to let people know. If you have not taken the course or you know somebody who would like to and they haven't yet, this is a time where we've, we've dropped the cost of it by, by a third instead of $150 for 12 weeks, it's $100 for 12. That's less than $10 for a video every week, a PDF download, an ebook, and plus access to online activation, a hands-on workshop every week. And we just encourage you to Man. take that. If you've taken the course before and you didn't advance to course number two, advanced prophetic gifting, or course number three on prophetic office, the same discount supply, uh, just uh, contact us. You should have gotten an email about that already. If you haven't, uh, just contact us on Facebook via email. We'll get that information out to you. Glory. And I've got a little helper making mantles. So when you graduate, Papa has, um, Michelle actually is helping me make mantles. And Papa lays them out on the couch when I give him the assignment to, to mail them to a particular prophet. And he prays over them. It's beautiful. So it's a fun thing to watch the people grow. And when we traveled for two weeks recently, uh, via car, we met so many people who said, I didn't get to finish number one, but I'm going to start it over again. And somebody said, I'm moving on to number two. They just kind of brought it up because they were getting excited about the prophetic. It's getting more yeah. um, notoriety these days. We people allow people, we allow you to go through the course at your own pace because it is an online course. We understand a busy life and we want you to get the best and the most out, out of them. And the whole point is to activate you in hearing the voice of God in your own Amen. life. And it'll change your life. So it'll good. change your life. If you're called to ministry, it will launch you into your ministry. And 
we just encourage you to do it. This is a time we don't often do these discounts, but this time around we decided uh, we would. We encourage you to do it. We encourage you, if you've taken course one, to look at one of the advanced courses. Uh, we want to bring the activation of God's voice into your life in full measure. Now, Amen. First Chronicles chapter 12, you, yes, you, mm -hmm. are one of David's mighty men. In this chapter, we see David at Ziklag. We looked at David at Hebron yesterday. Hebron means association. And so we understand that our, the Lord, David was crowned at Hebron, which means association, that it is through our association or relationship with Jesus that his lordship becomes a reality in our life. So where we see David as a type of Christ at these various places, it speaks to us of different things about our relationship to Jesus. David at, David at Hebron, being crowned at Hebron, speaks of the fact that his lordship is expressed through our intimacy with him. If we don't have intimacy and relationship, then his lordship is anemic in our lives because we don't have a relationship through which it's filtered. Mm -hmm. Authority does not extend beyond relationship. Authority that does extend beyond relationship is a controlling spirit. Let me say this to you it's good. again. Authority that extends beyond relationship is a controlling spirit. That's one of the things that, that's wrong with denominations. Denominations are set up so that leaders can extend authority beyond relationship. And it just does not uh, bring forth, uh, as it could otherwise, the peaceable fruit of the spirit. Authority does not extend beyond relationship, but it goes another way too. Your authority in Christ will not extend beyond the quality of your relationship with Jesus. Because Jesus, David as a type of Jesus, was crowned at Ziklag, and Z I'm sorry, crowned at Hebron, and Hebron means association. And now we're going to talk about David at Ziklag, which is another type of Christ. What does Ziklag mean? represent. I'm glad you asked because that's exactly <laughs> what this uh, chapter is, is all about. <laughs> Glory, have another sip of coffee in line. I have only had one cup, I know cup you of have. tea. Oh, that's right. My, my English friends would appreciate that. Uh -huh. Eunice. We do. And Carolyn. Carolyn and all and of those beautiful people <laughs> in Europe. So we see David at Ziklag. Warriors from many backgrounds joined themselves to David at Ziklag. And we see that in a time, and that in time, a great host that the chapter says, as the host of God, came to be with David and crown him king. The disciples who followed Jesus, likewise, remember David is a type of Christ. We're looking at the people that followed David. Now, then they are a metaphor, they are a shadow of the men that followed Jesus, including you and I, mm -hmm. um, those that followed Jesus, men and women. The disciples who followed Jesus were an impossible, an impossibly diverse uh, group of men and adverse one to another, but they found commonality in Christ as their David, as the son of David. When the host came to David, there was great joy and celebration. Listen, when we find our place of unity in Christ, our joy likewise will be full. You know how you can measure the health of a church? Let me tell you how you can measure the health of a church or any group. Take a note of how early people come before a meeting time and how late they stay after. <laughs> if the house is empty five minutes before service time, something is egregiously wrong in that group. If after the, the service everybody runs out and the sanctuary is empty five minutes after the service is dismissed, something is egregiously wrong. It is through the joy of fellowship and relationship. And so we will begin First Chronicles chapter 12. We're going to start with verses 1 through 14. Now these are they that came to David at Ziglag, while he yet kept himself close because of Saul, the son of Kish. They were among the mighty men helpers of the war they were armed with bows and could um, use both the right hand and the left hand at hurling stones and shooting arrows out of a bow even of saul's brethren of benjamin 
The chief was Ahazir, then Joash, the sons of Shema, uh -huh. <laughs> the Gibeathite, and Jezeel, Giz and Pellet, the son of Azmaveth, and Barak. Are you, did you trick me? You only did? And Jehu, the Antotite. And Azmaiah, oh, the Gibeonite, a mighty man among the thirty, and over the thirty, and Jeremiah, and Jehaziel, and Johanan, and Josabad, the Gederathite, <laughs> and Eluzai, and Jeremoth, and Beeliah, and Shemariah, and Shephathiah, and the Herophite, Goodness. and Elkanah, and Josiah, and Azareel, and Joezer, and Jashobim, the Korites, and Joela, and Zebediah, the sons of Jehoram of Gedor, and of the Gadites, there separated themselves unto David into the hold, to the wilderness of the men of might, and men of war fit for battle. Are you a man of war fit for battle? That can handle the shield of faith and the buckler of truth, whose faces were like the faces of lions, like the lion of the tribe of Judah, and were as swift as rose upon the mountains. Ezer the first, Obadiah the second, Eliab the third, Mishmana the fourth, Jeremiah the fifth, Attai the sixth, Eliel the seventh, Johanan the eighth, Elzabad the ninth, Jeremiah the tenth, Machbenei the eleventh. These were the sons of Gad, captains of the host. One of the least was over a hundred, and the greatest was over a thousand. Thank you, dear, <laughs> for catching that. <laughs> So in this chapter, we find further registries of David's mighty men who speak to us of Jesus himself and the army of saints that you and I are conscripted into as believers. In the previous chapter, we see the men that gathered to David at Hebron. In this chapter, we begin with those who gathered to him at Ziklag. Uh, Ziklag is an interesting word. Uh, because listen to what Ziklag means. Now, sometimes you might find you're with Jesus at Hebron. That means that Hebron represents being seated with Christ in heavenly places because it means seat of association. Uh, sometimes you're gathered to Jesus at Ziklag. Now, what, what would that mean? Well, if you remember what happened at Ziklag, that was where they went after we went out to fight a battle, and while they were gone, their wives and children were kidnapped. And when they came back, they all decided to, to assassinate David because all their wives and children were taken captive. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you are with Jesus at your Hebron, and sometimes you're with Jesus at your Ziklag. Now, let me give you a picture of what that is. Ziklag means the winding place. Now, it's not like a winding road. It's winding like you take a towel, you dip it in water, and you take it out, and you wind it to wring it out. Wring it out. Mm -hmm. It's the wringing out place. It also means, it's a very interesting word. It's got a deep definition. It, ziklag means the place of pressure in order to bring out what is on the inside. Mm -hmm. they, they, it's, it was a place where, remember we talked yesterday about how the Philistines were uh, iron workers? Well, Ziklag is the one place where the Israelites were involved in uh, extracting iron ore from the ground and smelting it into weapons. So think about Ziklag. Where ring, they, the idea was wringing out of the earth the iron so that they could heat it up and forge weapons. Hmm. So what that's saying is it's a forge. It's a, smelt, it's a smelting place. It is a crucible of okay. refinement. Okay. <laughs> like the refiner's fire. A place of pressure. How many of you are beginning to think that you spent a lot of time at Ziklag and you just didn't know it? Pressing into the pressure. It, it means a place of distress or oppression. Hmm. Uh, it means to squeeze in order to bring out what is contained internally. <laughs> but I want the wine of the Holy Ghost, but the wine has to be pressed. I want the anointing of God, but the olives have to be pressed. Amen. And so you, if you want the olive, the oil of God, you have to go through the olive press. If you want the wine of the vintage of what God is doing, you must go through the wine press. Uh, it means to extract as iron is extracted from the earth to smelt and bring forth as a forge. 
So this all speaks to us of what it takes to follow our David. If you're not, if you haven't been to Hebron, you will not survive Ziklag. If you haven't been to Hebron and to associate yourself with him, to become fascinated, remember it also means fascination, Hebron. If you're not, if he is not your fascination, mm -hmm. if you don't have a relationship with him, you will not survive Amen. the pressure that comes at Ziklag. Good uh, point. In Hebron, we gather to him and we establish our association with him because of our fascination with Christ. Remember, the tribes came and say, we are your bone and your flesh. We are married to you. Mm -hmm. The tribes married David. Isn't that an awesome thought? And it's a type of the bride of Christ. If you are not betrothed to him, it's like I'm ready to hold hands, but I'm not ready to kiss. Mm -hmm. And then you wind up in Ziklag and said, sayonara, I'll see you later. Because you can't handle the pressure. In this chapter, we see ourselves gathering to Jesus, our David, in times of intense pressure when our character is revealed. Whence do you turn when you are under pressure? Your actions under pressure reveal what is on the inside of you, Amen. what your true spiritual condition is. Boy, that's when I don't like me so much, when I find the pressure point hits and I go, oh, I reacted badly. Those are not fun times, but you got to almost locate yourself from time to time, don't we? It locates where we are, what we need to work on with our fruit of the spirit. That's right. At Ziklag, David and his men went out to battle. And while they were away, all their wives and children were taken captive by the Philistines. Mm -hmm. Remember who the Philistines were? Yes. The dividers. Yeah. How many come home? And your, your house is like uh, WWF World Wrestling. It's just to, act, to strife and all this going on. See, well, my, my children, my family's never, yeah, sure, they have whenever they can't speak a peaceable word when your house is filled with strife and there's no peace. What's happened? Your, house, your family's been taken by the Philistines. Mama. And who are we going to throw under the bus? It's usually the one that's closest to God that gets all the blame for all the stress and all the strife that's going on in the house. Boy, that's the truth. It needs to be taught more. So they returned and they're devastated and they're angry and they plot to kill David. Mm -hmm. They were under pressure and what was in them was revealed. I remember when I pastored my second church. For many years and the time came now listen under pressure what's in you gets revealed i was pastoring my second church i'd been there for many years and i was prepared to stay there till jesus came i would have been perfectly happy to do that and the lord told me he said i want you to resign and i said what do you mean i'd led most of the people <laughs> in that church to christ <laughs> they were my spiritual children I said, what do you mean you want me to resign? And the Lord said this to me, Russ, it is expedient that you go away for until you leave, what is in them will not be made yeah, manifest. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. That was and good. I just knew that was the word of the Lord. And I, I thought, I assumed that something really, really good would happen after I left. Mm -hmm. But in fact, uh, after I attended my resignation and made my departure, there were several leaders in that church who rose up and manifested their true character as a result of the pressure resulting from my departure. And unfortunately, it wasn't very good. It wasn't a very pleasant thing. It didn't show up while you were there. No, it wasn't. Well, and see, so it's through much tribulation. This is what Ziklag is what Acts 14.22 refers to when it says through much tribulation you enter the kingdom. Everybody wants to rejoice and have a party at Hebron, but nobody wants the pressure that comes at Ziklag. Mm -hmm. The word tribulation there in Acts 14.22 means manifold pressure. We aren't so much breaking into the kingdom as we are being extracted from the earthliness of our natural selves mm -hmm. and brought out, forged and smelted with the fire of God to take on his character and nature. Don't resist the process. Let the Lord refine us. Let him smelt us in the crucible of whatever your personal ziklag is that you might come forth as gold. And I think you can, I think you can do it. Read. Verse 15 <laughs> through 30. I'll keep you posted. <laughs> Verse 15. These are they that went over Jordan in the first month, and when it had overflown all its banks, and they put to flight 
all of them in, of the valleys, both toward the east and toward the west. And there came of the children of Benjamin and Judah to hold unto David, to the hold unto David. And David went out to meet them and answered and said unto them, If ye become peaceably unto me to help me, mine heart shall be knit unto you. But if you come to betray me to my enemies, seeing there is no wrong in my hands, the God of our fathers look thereon and rebuke it. Then the spirit came upon Amasai, who was the chief of the captains, and he said, Thine are we, David, and on thy side, thou son of Jesse, peace, peace be unto thee, and peace unto thy helpers, for thy God helpeth thee. Then David received them, and made them captains of the band. And there fell some of Manasseh to David, um, when he came with the Philistines against Saul into battle, but they helped that they helped them not. For the lords of the Philistines upon the advisement sent him away, saying, He will fall to his master Saul, to the jeopardy of our heads. As he went to Ziglag, there fell, on, of him, fell to him of Manasseh, Adna, and Josbad, and Je, Jedidiel, and Michael, and Josbad, and Eliu, and Zultiah, captain of the thousands that were of Manasseh Whew. and they helped David against the band of the rovers for they were almighty men of valor and they were captains of the host for at that time um, day by day there came to David to help him until it was a great host like the host of God and these are the numbers of the bands that were ready armed to war and came to David in Hebron to turn the kingdom to of Saul to him according to the word of the Lord the children of Judah that bear shield and spear were six thousand and eight hundred ready armed to the war of the children of Simeon mighty men of valor for the war seven thousand and one hundred of the children of Levi four thousand six hundred of Jeho Jehodiah was the leader of Aaronites and with him were three thousand and seven hundred and Zadok the young man of mighty mighty of valor and his father's house twenty and two captains, and the children of Benjamin, the kindred of Saul, three thousand four, hitherto the greatest part of them that had kept the ward of the house of Saul, and the children of Ephraim, twenty thousand and eight hundred mighty men of valor, famous throughout the house of their fathers. So we see that the warriors came to David from many tribes, and you notice David knew he confronted one group of them, and he said, if you betray me, so just like Jesus, you know, have I not chosen you and one of you is a devil? You know, betrayal happens. Betrayal is a reality. There will be people. And then Judas, think about it. Judas left his home. Judas gave everything up. He came to follow Jesus, but he had betrayal in his heart. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you can't tell by choices that others make in the beginning what's going to happen on the other side. And you so... don't need to be surprised or uh, uh, shocked in some way that such things would take place. But these warriors came to David from many tribes, and you and I each come from our tribes as well. When you consider the disciples of Jesus, it's amazing that he chose such a diverse group of men. Would you shut that door? Sure. It's in the kitchen. Oh. Uh, so the warriors came to David from many tribes, and you and I come from many tribes as well. Now let's look at the disciples. Andrew was a fisherman. Nathaniel was a member of the royal family and a distant relative of Jesus. Did you hear that? Andrew was a fisherman. Nathaniel was a member of the royal family and a distant relative of Jesus. Mm. James was a fisherman from Capernaum. James the Less was a tax collector. You think the tax collectors got along with the fishermen? You think the fishermen got along with the royals? Mm. With their high-mindedness and their yeah. sense of entitlement? John the Beloved, he was a fisherman. Ah, Judas Iscariot, he was a zealot. And if you understand what a zealot was, we would call a zealot today an extremist. Some people would call them a terrorist. Yeah. Can you imagine choosing a terrorist hmm. to be a part of, of your ministry? <laughs> uh, Thaddeus was likewise a zealot. 
and an ultra nationalist. Uh, Matthew, let's have another tax collector. Can you imagine the terrorist and the, the right wing extremist with the tax collectors? So he has multiple tax collectors, terrorists, fishermen. <laughs> you know those fishermen? They knew how to brawl. They knew how to have a fight. Can how did he keep them from killing each other? Oh uh, Peter was a fisherman. Philip was a fisherman. Simon was a fanatical nationalist zealot, another terrorist. <laughs> and Thomas, well, he was a twin, but nobody knows what he did for a living. You know, what do you do? What do you do around here anyway? <laughs> <laughs> I just follow Jesus. Maybe he was just a ne'er do well because he couldn't get his faith behind anything. I don't know. Wow. And but you see what a diverse group mm -hmm. of men in Genesis 15, 5. They probably looked at each other and say, why am I hanging out with you? Why is the tax collector hanging out with the terrorist? Why is the terrorist hanging out with the fisherman? Why is the man from royal blood hanging out with any of them? But those relationships are very eclectic mm -hmm. that come about whenever you follow after Jesus. Those men that followed David, they had warred against each other in times past. But now in David, they're finding unity. See, in Genesis 15:5. God told Abraham that his, now listen, his children would be as the stars of the heavens. What he actually told Abraham, he told Abraham to tell the stars using the word stel, which is an ancient writing instrument. So if you're going to stel the stars, what, he was at, what God actually told Abraham was connect the dots. Mm -hmm. He said, this is what your children will be like. It's a description of a constellation. Amen. God connects believers in eclectic and unusual constellations of relationships that would not exist outside the commonality found in Christ. Mm -hmm. Think about your brothers and sisters in Christ that you know very well, they know you, but if it wasn't for Jesus, you're from walks of life that you would never hang out together. You wouldn't have, why am I hanging out with you? How come <laughs> you're my friend? How can we worship together? Why? Because God has arranged us in these eclectic constellations of relationships. Awesome. It's not like the sand seed. The sand seed is just a pile of opinionated people. It's not the dust seed. That's just a bunch of carnal people getting together so the serpent uh, can have the serpent's food. Mm -hmm. You pile dirt together. You pile sand together. But you don't, and it's all, it's all held by gravity, which is the type of the earth, the type of the sin nature. See, Abraham had children that were as the sand of the sea. He had children that were as the dust of the earth. And he had children that were as the stars of the heavens. Mm -hmm. The stars of the heavens were the only one that were not, ones that were not earthbound. And their relationship to one another was for signs and for seasons. Mm -hmm. A pile of dirt is not for a sign for anything. <laughs> a pile of sand. Jesus said, don't build your house on sand. What does sand represent? Opinion, doctrine. It's basically what uh, Christian culture uh, is, is formed and shaped around today. But if you are the star seed, you, are, you will look around at the people God puts in your life and say, I don't even know why I'm hanging out with you. But I know God has ordained this relationship. I don't even like you. But I know God has ordained this relationship. You are, you are the star seed of God. He is connected. You, are, you have connectivity in Christ. See? God's able to create something beautiful out of that. I guess the willingness to, to walk together in love, to have Absolutely. Jesus in common. People can get things done. I'm glad we're not all cookie cutter Christians and all alike. <laughs> I'm good. glad I love different. I love variety. See, our connection to one another many times is very different and unusual. The people that God puts in your life, you might not otherwise have anything to do with, but yet we've been brought together for his purposes, just like David's mighty men and just like Jesus and his 12 disciples. Mm -hmm. And 31 Thanks, through the end of the chapter. Okay. And the half tribe of Manasseh, 18,000, which were expressed by name to come and make David king and the children of Issachar when they were men that had under which were men that had understanding of the times I know to know what Israel ought to do the heads of them were 200 and all the brethren were at their commandment of Zebulon such as went forth to battle expert in war with all the instruments of war 50,000 which could keep rank 
they were not of a double heart or double minded, and of Nephtali, a thousand captains with them and them and with them shields and spears thirty and seven thousand, and of the Danites, expert in war twenty and eight thousand six hundred, of Asher, such as went forth to battle, experts in war forty thousand, it's a lot of people. And on the other side of Jordan, of the Reubenites and the Gadites, and of the half tribe of Manasseh, with all the matter of in, manner of instruments of war for the battle, a hundred and twenty thousand. And all these men of war that could keep rank came with a perfect heart to Hebron to make David king over all Israel, and all the rest also of Israel were of one heart to make David king. And there, and there were. There they were. <laughs> there they, they were. There they were. With David three days, eating and drinking, for their brethren had prepared for them. Moreover, they that were nigh them, even unto Issachar and Zebulon and Naphtali, brought bread on asses, and on camels and mules, and on oxen and meat, meal cakes of figs, and bunches of raisins and wine, and oil and oxen and sheep abundantly, for there was joy in Israel. Let's have that. Now let's look at the typology. Jesus yes. is our David. They were with David three days. And what, what about Jesus? We've been with Jesus two days thus far. We mm -hmm. are now in the third day. And notice that it was their brethren that were preparing for them with David. And Jesus said, he that would be greatest, let him be servant of servant. all. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. After the initial gathering of mighty men to David, the host grows into a mighty army. It is a time of war and battles, but it's also a time of celebration and great joy. See, the kingdom, according to Romans, is righteousness, peace, and joy. If you don't have peace, it's not the kingdom. If you don't have joy, it's not the kingdom. Some okay. people are just baptized in bad news, <laughs> and they think the deeper you frown, the more spiritual you are. Oh, no. But that is those people with that grimace that they think is the anointing, mm -hmm. and they're bringing forth all this negative stuff. You know, always what, what part of gospel being good news don't we understand? That's why we constantly say it. The sky isn't falling. The kingdom, the kingdom is, is coming. coming. And uh, because the kingdom is what? It's righteousness, righteousness. peace, and joy. In the Holy Ghost. Celebration. Mm -hmm. There's camaraderie in Christ. For all the struggles and persecution and misunderstandings, we must never forget God sets the solitary in families. I get the out-of-church demographic. Mm -hmm. I understand why people say, I love God, but I'm done with church. Come on now. I totally understand that. I realize uh, the justification for that. But let me also say to you that, that God sets the solitary in families. Amen. He said in his word, it is not good to be alone. There, maybe we're not a part of a religious infrastructure, but we are one family in Christ, and we should and we must be connected to the larger purposes of God expressed in those eclectic relationships with those people that, quite honestly, may be quite different from you, but you are called into commonality in Christ. There is fraternity and brotherhood in Christ when we choose to overlook our differences and dwell together in unity. The problem is we're more invested in our differences in the opinions by which we differ with our brother than we are in our brother. We put our opinions and our doctrines and our theology and our habits of life ahead of relationship to our brothers and sisters sure. because we're walking in self-referral instead of God consciousness. We need to change that. Mm -hmm. See, David talked about unity. Listen to this. See, there is an anointing that is denied us. Was the anointing important? Well, let me tell you, there's an anointing that is denied us till we're in unity. I don't care how accurate your doctrine is. Some That's people think good. that doctrine brings uh, anointing mm -mm. But, and the outpouring of God. We think if we could just get an understanding of a particular message, bring a certain message, the message will bring the breakthrough and the anointing will come. Mm. That's a lie. That's a deception. That's based on Gnosticism. Mm. 
The church arranges itself based on what it knows. The second century church declared that kind of thinking, saying that knowledge is more important than relationship. They called that Gnosticism and branded it as heresy. Mm -hmm. But yet Christianity as we know it is based on Gnosis. It's based, it's, we're modern day Gnostics. We can look at the Gnostics of the second century and if you ever go read their writings, you can't even relate to it. I don't even understand these people. But yet today, we get two Christians together. They want to find out what do you know that I don't know? What do you know differently about God that I don't agree with you? They want to find out what is your gnosis? That's Gnosticism. That's right. We're not saved by That would imply salvation is in your head. Salvation is not in your head. Salvation is a relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not coming to God with your knowledge. It's coming to God with your ignorance and saying, I'm ignorant and I want to, I want to have relationship with you and I want to have relationship with uh, those that love you. Amen. The the early church, if they could see modern Christianity as we know it, the early church fathers would brand us as Gnostics and heretics, the most orthodox of us. And it's our gnosis that is the basis of our uh, of our differences, right. of our division. Say that again about the love is the breakthrough. Because it's love, it's our relationship one to another. We do not come to God. We do not walk with God on the basis of gnosis. We we walk with God on the basis. He said, they'll know you're my disciples, not by your doctrine. The devil is not intimidated by your gnosis. Next time you confront a demon, try and cast him out with your gnosis. With your knowledge mm -mm. try and heal somebody with your we're trying to hand people a book this book will give you breakthrough no it won't it's not what you know that brings breakthrough knowledge is a part of it knowledge is involved but there is no anointing on knowledge knowledge cannot contain the anointing in fact the scripture says knowledge puffs up mm -hmm. knowledge makes you think you have something that you don't knowledge makes you think that the dimensions of your spiritual life are something that they are not but notice what David says. And again, there is an anointing that is denied us till we are in unity. It's like Jacob. How come you're not watering the flock? Because we cannot water the flock until all the shepherds come together and roll away the stone off the well's mouth. There is an anointing in every city that will be denied you and be denied the churches in that city until all the shepherds come together and prevail to roll the stone away from the well's mouth of who Jesus is prepared to be in that city. There is an anointing David talks about in Psalm 133 that is denied us until we come together in unity. Psalm 133, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. I can imagine David writing this at Hebron. He said, it is like the precious ointment upon the head. Who is the head? Jesus. Jesus said, the works that I do shall ye do because I go to the Father. When's that going to happen? It's the anointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even upon Aaron's beard as a type of Christ our high priest, and went down on the skirts of his garments. In other words, the anointing that's on the head flows to the body when the brothers are in unity. Why do you think the devil has so successfully divided the church into 16,000 denominations and sects? No, my mind. You get believers together, you cannot achieve unity. Why? Because the enemy knows he can staunch the flow of the anointing that's on the head by keeping you and I out of unity with one another. Oh, I just can't believe be in unity with people that believe that. Why they believe thus and so, and they believe this and that. Yes, I understand. Your gnosis has become a basis of division. It's the Philistine mentality. You've chosen to be a divider instead of a uniter. And I understand what possible these, you know, the, the 12 disciples, what could Peter possibly get out of hanging out with a tax collector? What could Thaddeus, uh, Nathaniel, rather being of royal blood, possibly get out of hanging out with these low lowlifes that Jesus chose to be his, his disciples? I realize on a human level, there is very little to gain. But there is so much, but whenever we choose to come together in unity, we're not just uh, uh, restricted to the mutual resources that we can or cannot gain from one another. But when you and I choose to come together in unity and be brothers and sisters in Christ, suddenly that anointing that is upon the head who sits at the right hand of the Father, that anointing is going to begin to show up. It's going to begin to flow down upon us 
in our lives and in our commonality, in our camaraderie, and suddenly we're going to become more than the sum total of our parts. Amen. We're going to begin to do the greater works ministry. Yeah. Unity is more important than gnosis, Come on now. than knowledge. Amen. It's not important that we have all of our doctrine right, because it's not what we know that saves us. It's who we know. And he says, if you say you love me, but you don't love your brother, you're in deception. You're That's walking right. in darkness. Amen. We need to come to the place, you and I, that we can love those people that we have personality conflicts with. That's right. We can love those people and we don't like what they do and we don't like how they act and we don't like how they think. But it's important to understand that we come together. That tax collector decided to get along with that terrorist. That terrorist decided not to slit the tax collector's throat at night. And the fisherman decided he'd hang, he wouldn't go back to his fishing nets because he realized there was something to be gained in being with Jesus. And we cannot be with Jesus and be separate from one another. Amen. We must discover again in the earth what it means to be unified mm -hmm. together so that the so that the anointing that's on the head will flow down upon the body and we will experience the greater works ministry. When we dwell together in unity, the oil that is on the head, Jesus, flows down upon the body, you and I. That's why the enemy fights so hard to keep us divided and insular from one another. Offended. Mm -hmm. I'm mad you didn't shake my hand. You didn't hug my neck. I didn't like how they looked at me. They didn't speak to me. Let's get past all that. That's childishness. Wow, 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 my grandson <laughs> it's, said. It's keeping <laughs> us from an anointing that's available. Come on. See, the tribes from which the men uh, David chose, they often warred with one another. But they found unity in serving David. The men Jesus chose no doubt despised one another deeply because of their backgrounds, but they found unanimity in Christ. God wants you and I to walk in the same unity today. Yes, he does indeed. Father, help us, everyone, to be part of the solution of your kingdom and not part of the problem. Father, we want our lives to be adjusted so that we are a builder, a kingdom builder, and we're not one who subtracts or takes away from what you want to accomplish. And I, I, we know the secret, Father, is what we talked about yesterday, staying in your presence, staying in intimacy with you, and all of a sudden the yucky stuff falls off, all the, the silly things that come against us, we can wash ourselves and be washed of as we... Uh, you are revealed as we come into your presence. You said we're going to be like you, but first we have to see you to be like you. And I thank you, Father. You're strengthening our resolve to hear your voice, to hear your sound, so that we are making, uh, taking action and our words are lining up with your kingdom's um, possibilities, Father. We thank you for encouraging us today. We're not disappointed. We're encouraged that you you have a big plan and you plan on working your plan because you're the master. And we thank you for it, Father. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen.